Good morning. Everybody have a great Thanksgiving. You know, I'm going to open a restaurant, and one of my main dishes for the week after Thanksgiving is going to be leftovers. And what you do is you take the dressing, mashed potatoes, and gravy, and turkey, and mix it all together in a big bowl. That's what I do. Leftovers. We want to welcome Las Vegas this morning. Vegas, we love you. We miss you. You are part of our family. Hello, Las Vegas. Love these people. Well, today, what we're going to do, it's a holiday. We're going to do stuff a little bit different. But before we do, I, I was reading the Reader's Digest week. Uh, Reader's Digest this week, something I thought was really cool. It says the Greeks believed that their gods lived atop, on top of a very hikeable mountain, and yet no one ever bothered to go up and check. I heard some years ago that my God lived on a mountain and I went up and checked and you know what? He's there. He's there. I find it interesting that a lot of people today in the world, they hear that God's up on the mountain and they don't even go to bother to check. He's there. And uh, so today, a holiday weekend, do something rather unique. I, I, I'm going to put off the Bible study until next week, and we'll continue it next week. A lot of people are traveling and gone today, and I, I want to stay rhythmic with this Bible study, so I'm just going to kind of do something different today, come back to Peter next week. I want to take this opportunity to answer some questions that I've been asked a lot in the past few months, and the first question I want to answer is, are God's promises conditional or unconditional? I kind of touched it a couple of weeks ago, and I want to answer that question. Number two, is the Lord coming back soon? I'm hearing a lot of talk about this. I want to answer that question. Number three, what does it mean in the Bible when it says the violent take the kingdom by force? Ooh, I really want to talk about this one, and I'm afraid I'm not going to have time but let me say a couple things real quickly. In Matthew chapter 11, it, it comes out with this statement that has confused a lot of people. It says that the violent take the kingdom by force. Now, if I had time to fully explain it, context is king in this passage. Because th this, this phrase used in this verse is only used twice in the New Testament. In Luke, it... it, it takes the same verse and communicates in a little different way. It says that the people are forcing their way into the kingdom. And if you look at Matthew chapter 11, the first 19 verses talk about John the Baptist. And they compare John the Baptist with Jesus a couple times. And what we know about John the Baptist is that crowds followed him. And, and they went wherever he went. They went out in the wilderness and they were always wanting to be where John the Baptist was at. And after John the Baptist was thrown in prison and eventually killed, those same crowds followed Jesus. Now let me say something. John the Baptist was born with purpose. His purpose was to be a forerunner of the Messiah. Once that purpose was done, he was taken home. Hello, I've talked to you a lot about that. We said, well, John the Baptist, he was killed. Why was he killed? His, his purpose was over. We are citizens of heaven, just passing through the earth. Now, this violent take the kingdom, takes the kingdom by force idea is a graphic picture of the, the enthusiasm and excitement that was generated by the teachings of John and Jesus. That's what it's a picture of. People were so hungry for the truth that they couldn't keep themselves away. And it was a riotous type environment. Luke chapter 12 and verse one, it says there were thousands following Jesus that before that, followed John the Baptist. They were stepping on one another. 
It was a crazy picture. The violent are taking the kingdom by force. Jesus said, from the time of John the Baptist until now, that time frame, the violent are taking the kingdom by force. And you saw it. They were removing roofs off of buildings to get to Jesus. They were yelling. They were crying out. They were crowding one another. It was not an organized, polite, well-mannered group that was following Jesus and following John. Now listen to me. If you've ever traveled abroad very much, you'll see that sometimes there's not a lot of manners in other countries. We're a little better in here in America. But these people were desperate that were following John the Baptist. They were hearing good news. They were hearing something they've never heard before. And after he died, they started following Jesus. And they were desperate. Have you ever seen a desperate person trying to get their loved one healed? A desperate person trying to get their demon-possessed child delivered? Have you ever seen desperate people that have needs? What I want to tell you, and I don't have time to talk about it today because I have so much I need to do is that truth, when realized, creates passion. The more truth you know, the more passion it's gonna create. For example, and I'll just use this illustration and maybe it'll kind of tie everything together because I didn't, I don't have time to talk about it today exhaustively. This will sound like a story I've told before, but it's fresh and new. It's just using the same mechanics of the old stories. But on Tuesday night, I came in and told Debbie I'm having the same symptoms of COVID that I had the first time I had COVID. I was chilling again and I was aching and I wasn't feeling well and I thought, maybe I've got COVID for the second time. And we had planned this Thanksgiving holiday months ago. I went out and bought all my grandkids, or the three grown ones, not the two-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, but I bought them shotguns. And we were going to the mountains, gonna shoot targets. They had never shot before. I made them take their, their safety course. And we had all these plans. We were going, riding side-by-sides. We were doing all this stuff. And so I told Debbie, I'm not feeling well. I didn't want to tell her how bad I actually felt. It was the same symptoms pretty much that I had before. And so I told Debbie, I said, I have to pray through this. I got to get violent in the spirit right now. And so as she sat in the big chair, I started walking the floor with my Bible. And I said, Father God, right now in Jesus' name, I am not going down sick on this holiday. I have planned this and planned this. And your word says, if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. That's what it says. It is not your will that I go lay in a bedroom for three days while my grandkids come. It's a time for me to, to be with them. They're getting older. They're going to get married and have their own family someday. And I know it's not your will. And so I'm asking according to your will that you heal me right now. This is the same floor I walked a few months ago when you healed me instantly of a pain in my stomach that had been there for two weeks. Uh, this is the same idea of what I did in Africa when they were trying to rush me to a hospital. And I said, in Jesus' name, I will not take it. If it's according to your will for me to be with my family on Thanksgiving, you're gonna heal me right now. I know you will. I curse every sickness in my body, every virus. I command you to da da da. And immediately, immediately I was well. After about 20 minutes, I woke up the next morning fine, went and celebrated. The whole thing, the sniffling, the runny nose left, the aches left, the chills left. Now everybody has COVID in my family today. No, I'm not, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but I wanted to answer this question. I don't have time. When you see a verse like that, the violent take the kingdom by force. Context is king. Context is supreme. When you read what... The spirit of that chapter is trying to say, you will see exactly what it means. Now, I don't have time to answer that. I kind of did, huh? Number four, I wanted to talk about why I should give tithes. I've had several people ask me that. And number five, when should I fight in a spiritual battle and when should I surrender? Now, the first two questions I'm going to answer in a video. 
And that might be as far as we get the first two questions, I don't know. But I wanna take you up to the church ranch right now. I wanna talk to you about 15 minutes and I'll be back out to continue, okay? Everybody's going to wonder where we're at up here today. When they look around, they're going to go, what Sunday school class is that? <laughs> so you want to tell them where we're at? I had a poker table and a saloon. We're in a bar. <laughs> is that where we're at? No, uh, not quite. But um, Yeah, we're up at the ranch. Uh, at, the, at the ranch, and uh, you guys, actually, uh, the church uh, bought this place, and it had a bar and had a saloon, and so... You put a bunch of fake liquor there because we want to look like we're, uh, we're drinkers. And <laughs> yeah. If you're yeah. a mighty man, this is not new to you. You right. come up for some retreats here. Yeah. Yep. This is Shady Springs Ranch. This is the miniature calico west. <laughs> and I'm telling you, we got general store, we got jailhouse, we got bathhouse. This saloon is outrageous. Pretty sure this is like how Knott's Berry Farm started. It's got to be the way Knott's Berry Farm started. <laughs> we are starting Knott's Berry Farm. I think people would drive up here. Everything in here is the 1800s, yeah. everything. That's and it's cool. so cool. It's really something to see you guys. <laughs> yeah, we even have uh, bloody... Um, bloody cards. Bloody cards. cards. <laughs> kind of and we got, we got want, wanted posters. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, hey, we're up here today. And, uh, and we all have some questions on our mind. And I had a couple. And, and these have to do with our Bible study because I'm going to continue our Bible study today. And uh, so just some questions I needed, I needed to throw out there and let you guys discuss with me. And one of them came up on our Bible study. Uh, a week or two ago, and it was our God's promises conditional. Mm-hmm. And we've got to know that. Are they unconditional or are they conditional? Now, I think I have an answer to this, but I want to hear what you guys have to say. Do you think his, his promises are conditional or unconditional? I, I'm interested because I, it's a tough question. I was looking and I came to a conclusion, and I, feel free to correct me faster. I saw a little of both in a way, and let me explain. Um, God promising that he set a rainbow. He's not going to flood us again. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think there's anything I can do in my little body to change that. But God, God saying he would save the world through Jesus Christ is a promise as well. Mm -hmm. But I had to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior and choose to follow. I think I think a simple answer for that question is um, if God puts a condition on it, then (laughs) there's a condition. If he doesn't, then there's not. You you have taken the whole solution out of my lips (laughs) because I was going to say the same. Some are conditional. Some are not. But but here's the thing. For example, I, I, I repeated this in my sermon. I have this video, crazy video of this crazy doctor story. This doctor is a really born-again Christian. Long story short, they bring a guy to him. The guy dies in the hospital room. And this doctor, you know, pronounced him dead, leaving the room. God spoke to him, go back and pray over this guy and do this, this, this. He went back. God said, go back again, again, again. The guy came back to life. Mm -hmm. And it was incredible. And so what I kind of took off on is what this doctor said to the next doctor who was taking his shift. This doctor was leaving. Another doctor was taking a shift. And he said to this other doctor, he said, hey, he's yours. Do whatever you want to him because you can't kill him because God wants him alive. Hmm. You can't kill him. Hmm. And, and that was kind of like, you know, what got me going on this. But Josh, yeah. you said it well. And you said it well, Justin. That, you know, with the commandments in the Old Testament, it says, if you do this, you'll be successful. If you don't do it, you'll be cursed. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, you took the words right out of my mouth. If God gives promises with conditions, they're conditional. If he gives no conditions, they're not. Well, I think, too, uh, there's the large story that God is going to take care of his people. And then there's the individual stories where, you know, God does put responsibility on us uh, as we grow in the faith. And, um, you know, when we're young in in the faith, I don't know if we have as much responsibility. But as we get older, it's like I think God wants us to to stand on our two feet a little bit and be adults, you know. Well, you know, it was like when God told me when I was dying of cancer. He says, I'm not going to let you die. You're not going to die. But he put no conditions on it mm. because I did everything to mess it up. I went and took all these medicines. I was doing all this stuff. He there was no conditions. He said, you're not going to die. And I think there are, condi- there are promises that God's going to give to our people. Yeah. And they're not having conditions on them. 
And if there's no conditions on them, then there's no conditions intended. Right. And you can't do anything to mess it up. If he says something, like he's promised me several things in my life, mm-hmm. and there were no conditions on it, mm-hmm. and I did everything in my power to mess them up, like Abraham even, you know, and David, we take some of these guys that God gave promises to, and doggone, they did everything they could do to mess so them up. What if but we, they didn't mess them yes, up. Let me ask you this. Um, go off script a little bit and, and ask you, what if somebody feels like they have messed up God's promises for their lives. I mean, what, do you, what would you tell somebody like that? Because I, I've noticed a lot of people, um, if they mess up, then they think that, oh, well, I'm out of God's will, so, so it doesn't matter anymore. So they quit church. They start, you know, drinking a lot. Like I've seen people go completely south because of one mess up. And, and you know, maybe they're missing the mark on something. Maybe well, I've taught for years, problems. Josh, that they're a primary, the primary will of God and they're secondary. Mm-hmm. And if you miss the primary and you mess it up royally, mm-hmm. just repent, get back to God. And if he can't give you the primary will back, which he can very often, he'll give you the secondary. And that secondary will be as good as the primary. And is it, don't you think, too, that's a great answer. I, I agree with that 100%. Don't you think, too, there's, a, there's a, a reward of just having God in your life, even if you have you know, not been as successful as you might have been otherwise. Like you still have God, you still have him, you know, I I consider knowing the greatest accomplishment in my life is knowing the Lord. I fully believe according to pastor Ron's word, I could have had a different route in sports and a lot of things, but my personal choices messed that up. Correct. But it didn't fight in Christ and becoming a pastor, pursuing youth, youth ministry, I found a whole new calling. Yeah. It was well, well worth it. Was was it the original plan? God could have used me in tons of other things <laughs> right. and still use me to glorify well, the I, Lord. My wife asked me just a couple nights ago, she's like, do you have any regrets in life? And I said, no, not really. You know, And it's not that I haven't done anything wrong. I've done lots of things wrong. Um, I've made a lot of decisions that weren't good decisions. Mm-hmm. But at the end, you know, you, you do see how God makes all things work together for good. And and it's kind of a, it's built my faith. Well, there's one there too. Honest. There's a condition yeah. on that one, right? That God will cause all things to work together for good for th- those who are called according to his purpose and yeah, love him. And who love him. Yeah. And, but shouldn't we all yeah. love him and be called according to his purpose? So many of the conditions are automatically filled by people who love God. Yeah. Yeah. They're automatically. So in a way, there aren't a lot of conditions to promises when the promises conditions are just living well, I think wholeheartedly it's such, for God. I think yes, this is such the answer is most of it. It's such an important topic because I think the devil lies to us so much and says, you know, you're not good enough. You'll never make it. There you, you go. You ruined everything. There you go. You, uh, you know, the, the, the plan God has for you, it's nothing now and you don't even matter anymore. And yet we're still breathing. Well, Josh, still- that's, that's just what I'm driving at. Because it's our human nature to think he's given me a promise and I'll mess it up. So I'm not going to have faith in the promise anymore. Mm -hmm. You got to know his promises are bigger than your mess ups. When he gives a promise, man, those things, they have a long shelf life and a tough shelf life. And usually, or not usually, but a lot of times they're made without conditions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there are conditions. But if you're loving God with all your heart, you'll be fulfilling those yes. conditions. He loved us while we were still yet sinners. And I think it's so important that when you sin again or you feel like you fall again, remember, Jesus didn't come get you because you were perfect. Yeah. He came and got you because you were a It's sad because I think a lot of people have such a limiting view of God because of what they've been taught or maybe the culture around them, uh, maybe their upbringing, you know. Uh, but God is so much bigger and so much more gracious, but also just a good father. He disciplines us well, you know, and he Very molds us so. and shapes us. And so, well, you know, that, that goes back to the second question I wanted to ask. And it has to do with the coming back of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Now, I was at uh, an appreciation dinner at our Northwest campus the other night. Mm. And I was appreciating the volunteers. And I said, a lot of you really believe that God sees what you're doing and he'll reward you when he comes back. Mm. Because here, here's our, our, we got a problem, guys. Mm. Because if I read the Bible correctly, the spirit of the letter says that if you get paid for doing what you're doing, then you won't get a reward in heaven necessarily because mm. you've already got your payment. Yeah. So for us, I mean, it translated to me that I've worked like 70 hours a week because I wanted the 2030 to be for God. Yeah. And maybe that's not, you know, precisely the way it's meant. But I think so often in the church world, I see us trying to pay everybody, give them some, you know, here's something for doing this, here's something for doing this. Mm -hmm. And we're taking their rewards away. Well, we're robbing them too. We're robbing them of rewards. Uh, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So I've always thought that, you know, if you put, if you 
if your treasure is God and things of the, of, of, of the kingdom of heaven, then you put your you put everything you have into that. You put your time, your, your uh, resources, your energy, uh, your gifts and all those things. And you will start to care about that more. You know, your heart will follow that passion. Yeah. Um, and uh, just, my wife was just reminding me of that the other night too. She's she's my counselor right now, so it's, yeah. <laughs> it's oh, that, they're all it, are they all are isn't counselors, good, right? Isn't, isn't, isn't your wife your counselor? Person. Isn't it nice uh-huh. when God gives you the right uh-huh. one? Oh gosh, you know you can't make it ministry without the right one. Is that right? I, I couldn't make it in anything. There's no way. Yeah. Not even just ministry. I don't know how he can, if he who finds a good wife and found a good thing is so true because yeah, I, I rely on Cassie, my wife. To, to I don't know if she if she always thinks the same uh, with me, <laughs> but I, I definitely same boat. I definitely uh, have always known that, that God brought my wife into my life, and she's just like the strongest person right now for me. You know, and yeah. it's just been really cool to have that. Well, well, you know, going back to our subject. We have a lot of workers. I mean, people like us, this is our living. Yeah. So we got it paid, obviously, because we have to get 40, 50 hours a week. And we can't, don't have time to go out and make a living. That's basically it. Mm-hmm. But for so many of the volunteers out there, they are, I hope, they're choosing to believe that when I go to heaven, I'm going to be rewarded for one of these things. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I, I brought to their attention the other day... Uh, the fact that one day I was standing in the back of the church and, and you know, defining moments because they're with you today like like they happened yesterday. But it happened like 30 years ago, 20. Mm-hmm. I'm standing in the back of the church and and I felt this conversation going on in my head with God. Mm-hmm. And he says, you're pretty proud of what you're doing. Huh? And I said, yeah, man, we're growing. We got revival. Da, 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 da. And I felt like God said, you know what? Anybody would do what you're doing for the salary you're getting. Mm-hmm. Anybody. And it's just kind of. Knocked me upside the head going, whoa. Which and is so, insanely high, by the way. We don't want to start a new rumor yeah. here. <laughs> <What's that? laughs> so, so anyway, long story short, I started thinking, God, I just got to serve you. I've been called. See, you don't have a job. Mm-mm. And you don't have a job. I don't have a job. This is a calling that we're just living out. And people are gracious enough to pay us to do it. Yeah. But it's something I would have to do if I was a volunteer, whatever. People don't understand how intertwined our whole being is. Oh, it's day and night. Uh, At three in the morning, my phone goes off. I have to pick it up, answer it, see if it's important. This is 24-7. It's not something where you come home, punch a clock, and say, I'm out. I'm off. If I go to the grocery store, I'm on. If I go to the mall, I'm on. And and, and, and you feel it, too, because you care about the people. There's a few people right now that are going through hard times, and it's just it has really jacked me the last few days. You know, just thinking about their lives, thinking about what they're going through. Um, I I just, uh, that's one of the things that I really appreciate about our church is is when we see somebody hurting, you know, we will go to them and we'll talk to them and and help them out. We have shepherd's hearts. Yeah. That, 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 uh, Wisconsin thing of that car driving That's through the crowd. That's so sad. I sat and wept today. I actually had tears running down my face. I was wiping, taking my glass off, wiping them. Little kids are in the hospital fighting for their life. Hit by cars. That's what that's what empathy is. Okay, I, I, I've been experiencing that because, of course, my son's in the hospital. And um, Josh has called to pray with me. Um, yeah. um, the church, I haven't had, I've had the kids solo, which is not easy. Um, I haven't. I've, I had to cook one meal so far. It's been a week. The church has <laughs> came and brought meals. That's it's cool, cool to see. That's really cool. And it makes me wonder how do people survive not being involved yeah. in the church? Like, yeah. I can't do. This. I'm. I'll be humble enough to admit I can't do this life alone. I yeah. thank God we have a church. I thank God I have pastors. It's a family. Like, isn't it? It's it's amazing. And, it, and um, I just I feel I feel for the people who don't have that. Like as yeah. you were talking about feeling yeah. for people, how I feel for it? people who don't have a relationship. Well, there with are a lot God. of people that, are, that have isolated themselves because of pride or whatever. And when they need others, they still stay in isolation because that's how they set up their life. You know. Josh hates this, but I'm gonna get a little theological on you. <laughs> okay, I know you hate that. <laughs> but I'm really wondering: Does the average Christian out there really, really believe the Lord's coming back? If they did, they might be changing their lifestyle a little bit. Mm -hmm. He's coming back. We're going to give an account for everything we did to make disciples on this earth. Now, with that said, we are seeing the climate of our culture and nation change so rapidly. Someone asked me a question of the day. Pastor Ron, is the vaccine the mark of the beast? Well, obviously it's not. Mm -hmm. But when people ask that, immediately bells go off in my head going, they don't know their Bible. They don't know their Bible. 
Why isn't the vaccination the mark of the beast? Well, here's the deal. We're told, we're told specifically in scripture, whether it's symbolic or not, we're not sure. But in the last days, there would be a mark given to people, either on their right hand or forehead. Without it, they can't buy or sell. Now, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, three years ago, I thought, man, that's never going to happen. That's so far off. But today, we're seeing economical discrimination right now. Yeah. I mean, stuff's moving so quickly that you could see how this could happen. Well, the Lord's coming back. He really is. Now, the Bible says that there are going to be a lot of tough times in the last days. In fact, if you have time this week, read 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. There, Paul uses 19 words and phrases to describe the people who are going to be in the world in the last days. And he says they'll be lovers of themselves, they'll be heartless, and they'll be brutal. We live in almost a paparazzi type culture today in the fact that people think nothing of invading other people's lives, their private lives for entertainment. They think nothing of it. Uh, we look at people, we hear what they're saying on social media, we see too much of their lives really. And if they say something that we disagree with, we write them off. If they make a mistake, we don't let them off the hook. If they say something we don't, we don't agree with, we crucify them. We think it's absolutely no big deal to brutally make sport of people on late night television. It's just brutal. Social media. It's almost like a society today who's living with a two by four in their own eyes and they're trying to get the splinter out of everybody else's eyes. It is ridiculous. It's a, it's a sad day to be living in. Yet also, on the other hand, it's a day in which if we see the challenge, we can let our lights shine bright in a dark world and we'll really stand out. Second Peter 3, 3 through 4, it says, scoffers will come in the last days saying, humbug, where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers have fallen asleep, everything stays the same from creation. Well, they're really wrong. That's not true. And now if you go look humbug up in your Greek dictionary, that, I, I added that, okay. That's not really in scripture. But do you agree with me that something really, really ugly is happening today? Something really, really ugly. Something that is, that is very hate-filled. There's not only hate-filled stuff going on, but there's also, there's discontentment, there's frustration, there's, there's anger. Uh, you could go on and on. Now, I'm proposing to you that this is just the start of something that's gonna get ultimately worse. Now, listen to some of the promises God has given us. Look at Luke 21, 36. It says, but keep on the alert at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape all these things that are about to take place and to stand before the Son of Man. Look at Luke 21, 28. But when these things that we're seeing today begin to take place, and remember, it's like birth pains, when you see them begin to take place, and we're seeing them begin to take place right now, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And then look at Revelation 3 and 10. Because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. I found something very interesting in Revelation chapter 13. It speaks of earth dwellers, people that will be on the earth in the middle and near the last of the tribulation period. And when you look up in the Greek, that term for earth dwellers, it's a people of a certain kind, a people of a different kind. In other words, in Revelation chapter 13, it seems to indicate that the believers have left the world. They're not here any longer. 
There are only earth dwellers on the earth. The believers have apparently gone somewhere before the mark of the beast even takes place. Now, again, I said on the video, I've heard the question asked several times, Pastor Ron, is the COVID vaccine, is that the mark of the beast? Now, obviously, only people who haven't taken the vaccine ask that question. It's not those that have taken it. But I feel bad because they don't know their Bibles. They know just enough to be dangerous. Saddens my heart to think that there are Christian people out there that actually think that God could dupe us with some kind of mark without us, us not even knowing what we're taking. Well, I got the vaccine, I'm lost. That that would even enter the minds of Christians who are supposed to be educated. That God would trick us into some mark and, and as a result would be eternally doomed. That, that, do you walk with that kind of God? Look at what Revelation 13, 10 says in the first phrase. It says, if anyone is destined for captivity, then to captivity he goes, if he's destined to it. And then look at Revelation 13, 15 through 17. It says, and it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now what? The people that won't worship the image of the beast, they're killed, they're gone. They're not on the earth. And then he causes all, the small and the great. He causes all, do you see all there? The small and the great, and the rich and the poor, and the free men and the slaves, to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell, except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of the name. Now it blew me away a few weeks ago when the governor of California said that he was going in LA County to require for people to enter certain grocery stores, certain restaurants, certain places. He was gonna require them to show proof of vaccination. So in other words, you see what we're saying. 10 years ago, I never would have dreamed we could have come to this place to where actually you're gonna to have to show something to buy. You're gonna to have to show something. If you're a company owner, you have to show something to sell. There's gonna be requirements for, for buying and selling. Man, that's come quickly. Wow. Now listen to me closely. I am not advocating either a pro-vaccine stance or an anti-vaccine stance. I believe as a pastor I'm to keep the politics out of the pulpit. I'm not here to clean up the fishbowl, I'm here to save the fish. Someone sent me this quote the other day and I like it. Here it is, evangelical religious leaders need to retire from politics and reestablish their authority over the religious field. They should focus on building the kingdom instead of changing the culture because the culture has already colonized their kingdom. Oh, amen and amen to that. One famous comedian even suggested a while back that for people that aren't vaccinated, the hospital should refuse to treat them. Where have we went so quickly, so quickly? It's almost like a dress rehearsal for something coming down the road. Doesn't it sound like it? And remember, the Lord said, when these things start happening, they're gonna happen faster and faster and faster. I'm telling you, we are on the brink of the return of Jesus Christ. We better get holy and get right. Uh, we better get right. It's a practice round for something bigger. Something's around the corner. Let me say these three things and we're gonna end with the other, the last four minutes of the video and then I'm gonna come back out and we're gonna do something cool. But the first thing I wanna say is Jesus is coming back. Just like the first coming caught the world at large asleep. They kept believing that some young girl was going to be impregnated with the Messiah. And they believed it for, for years and years and years. There was a lot of talk. And then one day they go, he's here. The Virgin Mary has had a child. 
The Messiah has been born. And it just, whoa, the whole world was turned upside down. It came on the scene out of nowhere. And it's gonna be the same thing with the second coming. Number two, we need to wake up and get serious about kingdom business. We need to start sharing our faith, start dealing with the sin in our life. I mean, some of the old preachers of, 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 of the ages would come out and do radical sermons on repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. I'm telling you, he's coming back. We need to get serious. And the third thing I wanted to say is that we need to be the light in a very dark world. I'm sure I could think of many examples of this, but I know you can figure it out on your own. We need to get serious about being the light in a dark world. I was up with some of the guys in Twin Oaks, four of the young guys, not too long ago. And we were in a very small restaurant eating. It was crowded, there wasn't much room. And so I had to go to the restroom. So there was about this much space between me and a guy and I, I kind of excused me and I went on by and I came back and he took his chair and scooted it out in front of me where I couldn't get through. And he says, next time you don't invade my space, you got it, buddy? He said, I don't want you or anybody else's butt in my face. And I said, whoa. And so I said, okay. And I sit down and I said, you're kidding me, aren't you? He said, no, I'm not kidding you. I said, okay, got it. He said, you can go way around, all right? Well, there's a little bitty place. There's not a way around. There is no way around. And so I sat there for about 10 minutes and we were eating. I don't know if the young guys even knew what was happening. And I looked over and tapped him on the shoulder. I said, sir, I really am sorry. I'm sorry I did that. And you know what happened? His wife started in on me. He said, yeah, you should be sorry. You, got to, you can walk out there. You can go outside and go around. And she got onto me. I said, oh man, this is going nowhere, God. I said, well, I just want to say I'm sorry again. And so I went back and started praying under my breath. And about 10 minutes went by and he turned around and said, are you new up here? I said, well, we just bought a ranch up here and we're, we're kind of fitting in. He said, hey, I want to tell you something. I'm really sorry about the way this thing started. I said, that's okay. He said, no, no, I'm really sorry. I said, that's all right. He said, what's your name? I said, Ron Vietti. And the two ladies with him said, Vietti, are you related to the Viettis and Arvin? That's an honorary group. I said, yeah, I'm part of them. And then she said, one of the Vietti is the pastor of a big church. I said, oh, I think that's me. <laughs> and we ended up exchanging cards and talking. And when I left, one of the boys said, pastor, you just modeled for us the way we're to handle things like this. And now 20 years ago, I would not have handled it that way. I had a hot head and a hot temper. But I want to go back. We're going to end the video and then I'll come out, okay? Let's end the last four minutes. One day I went downstairs at, my, at our house when I was, in, I was 16 years old and uh, not, living, not living right. And I uh, went downstairs and the stove was on. Uh, there was water boiling. Uh, the TV was on. I know where this uh, is going. And the door was kind of cracked and nobody's there. And I was like, it happened. It's over. It happened. It's over. I'm like, you okay, were left. what am I going to do? Where are the guns? Where are the guns, right? Uh, they were just outside. And, and but that's also from that movie we used to play, that old yeah, left behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's exactly how it so started. So the second story is I'm driving down the street one day, uh, right, on 24th Street toward uh, 58. And I look up in the sky and I see this bright light. And it's like it's like twilight. And I'm like, what is that light? What is it? I'm like, it's, he's, he's coming. He's coming right now. I'm like, all right, Lord, whatever you want. You know, I'm sort of praying. How many <laughs> times? I don't know if you've balloon. done this, but how many times <laughs> has my heart started beating fast? I'll go, Debbie, Debbie. Yeah. And I think she's on the house. She's not outside. I knew she was more spiritual than me. I knew it. The rapture's happened. She's gone, and I was left. <laughs> I've, I've even walked into our offices before, and it's just like oddly empty, and I'll yeah. be like, oh, there's no way. There's no way. <laughs> and you know what's funny is, is, is we, we have a hard time fully understanding all of it, but so did the, the first disciples. When they were yeah. in the, the, uh, the, the upper room and Jesus came to them, they were still asking for political uh, uh, asylum. They were still asking mm -hmm. for political change. And um, I see it today. A lot of Christians are so focused on politics and so focused on, you know, we want things to change in our culture. Whereas if you read the Bible, well, it, it's not going to get a lot better uh, culturally. It's not going to get a lot better uh, in our 
countries, it's going to get gnarlier. Well, it's it's Josh, gonna again, people to God, right? People are getting all freaked out about what's going on in the world right now, and it's crazy. But this stuff has to take place. Now, now get this. If it's, like Jesus said, it's birth pain. It's going to get faster, 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 faster. And it's really bad, pretty bad right now. Again, I really believe we are very close to the return of Jesus. And I think most Christians are sleeping. They don't believe that. I really do. And I, I want to be found ready the yeah. minute he comes back. So anyway, this question was just on my mind because it's going to come up in our Bible study. I'm telling you now, I'm like Noah building the ark. The rain's coming. It's coming. No one listened to him. And so the Lord's coming back. We need to be all about making disciples. We need to be about getting the bad stuff out of our life, getting close to God. So let me ask you this real quick. Last question. What's your biggest fear for the generation, uh, our generation and younger? My biggest fear is this. The Bible says in the Old Testament, there was a generation that rose that didn't even know God. And my biggest fear is that that slowly but surely parents are not handing the faith down, not radical faith. And that we're going to raise up a generation that goes, who's God like in Israel, went to Israel. You, you were with us. And with those young teenagers all over the streets in Israel would say, you know who Jesus is. Now go, who's that? Mm. You know, he didn't know who Jesus what's, was. What's interesting, this is a gut check for me, is growing up in our house, uh, you didn't just assume that I was going to get it all in church. You didn't right. assume I was going to get it all in mm. kids' ministry. You instilled it in me every night. Every I wanted you to get night. more in the house by far than you would get at church. Yeah, and you did. And that's why probably why I have faith today. And so that's a gut check for me to, to make sure that I'm doing that with my kids. I do it, but I, I, I yeah. need to do it better. You well, know? we all do. And your kids, yeah. you know, it's, we're going to be sitting here like it's someday. It's going to. Oh, man. All right. All right. Just got to figure this out. We couldn't resist. We were looking at one another, and Josh said, how, Dad, how do we end this? I said, I got an idea. That might be somewhat what it's going to be like for some people. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, I thank you that we have the hope of your return. Life is not going to stay like it is. God, in the Bible, it's called the blessed hope. Over 300 times in the Bible, you talk about the return of Christ. You have your prophets talk about it. The return of Christ, when he comes back, live for that day. And we're going to see it in our Bible study next week. It's all over the pages of the Bible, the hope of the return of Jesus. If you're in Vegas today or you're out there in one of the other campuses or you're just watching on the internet, it's time to get serious about God. We know how the story ends. The Lord's coming back and we're gonna live with him for eternity in heaven. And so I pray today, Lord, there would be a, a spirit in us to get things right. There would be a spirit in us that would be quickened, that would cause us to focus on heavenly things and not just earthly things for the goal is in sight it's not far away and we're going home but we still have a lot of work to do on this earth if you're listening to me today and you've never given your life to the Lord it's real easy today just get alone somewhere or if you're at, a, at one of the campuses come up and let somebody pray with you or you can go in your bathroom like I did one day and just say Lord right now I want to give my life to you send your spirit and come and live in my body give me the strength I need to start following you and then you get you a Bible start finding you a church start going to church start learning about God and practicing his ways and the journey will begin Thank you, Lord, for everything. In Jesus' name, amen. Right now, I'm going to hand the service over to the campus pastors at the other campuses. Hey, church family. We're so glad you stopped by to check out this video today. Before you go, we just want to share a few things with you. If this is your first time checking us out online, I want to encourage you to head to valleyvegas.org. You can see all of our upcoming events. You can see all the life groups you can get plugged into. And you can also see all the ministry opportunities we have going on at our church. 
Also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can do that by heading to valleyvegas.org slash give. While it's awesome that we can meet and have church right here like this, we would love to see you here on campus with us. Want to let you know our service times, which are 9 a.m., 10, 15, 11, 45 a.m. on Sundays, as well as a 7 p.m. service on Wednesdays. We hope to see you online or in person again real soon. God bless. Thank you.